Well, welcome everybody. I'm so glad you're here. Winter is almost over, man. Spring is just around the corner. Uh, and what happened with Puxatani Phil, but I don't really have a whole lot of confidence in him anyway. The Olympics finish up tonight with the closing ceremony. We thank God for our country. We thank God for our athletes. Uh, this week was a, uh, a, a tremendous milestone in my life and in many of your lives as uh, Dr. Billy Graham, uh, pastor to our nation, pastor to our presidents, uh, went home to be with Jesus. Some of you, if you've been listening to the radio, they, they quote Billy Graham, uh, which really is a quote from D.L. Moody, that one day you will hear that I am dead. When you hear that, don't believe it for one minute, for at that moment I will be more alive than ever before. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. We, we believe that here because it's in the Bible. We believe that to be absent from our body is to be immediately present with Jesus. So I don't even like to hear people say that so-and-so is dead. Now, I know technically there's the death thing, but the death thing that's only an instant begins life in eternity somewhere. If you know Jesus, it's with God in heaven. If you don't, that's bad news there. There's a hell for those who reject Jesus. But Jesus' invitation is open to everybody. Uh, some of you don't know this, uh, Chris Roberts had a birthday this week, and uh, Chris Roberts is one of our pastors here. He was just up here just a few minutes ago, and, and I, I didn't know this till this week that he and Billy Graham were the same age. Did you know? <laughs> Chris and Billy Graham walked the platform at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, Chris was receiving his BS degree. I won't, I won't even comment on that. But he was getting his degree prior to his dentistry. And, uh, but Dr. Billy Graham, really, that same time, was walking across the platform to receive his honorary doctorate. So I think Billy and Chris are both 100 years old. Give it up for Chris. Yeah. If you're just joining us, we're so glad you're here. We're doing an unapologetic series. Now, apologetics is a defense for what we believe. It, we do not believe as Christians that you check your brain at the door when you become a Christian. We don't believe it's for ignoramuses. We believe it's for people who are ignorant, but it's for everybody. It's for brilliant people. It's for scientists. It's for people who have never had a privilege of an education. It's for everybody. And, but we don't believe that it's a step into the dark. It's a leap into the light. Amen? Amen. It makes sense. Life without God, last week we discovered life without God does not even make sense. There's no purpose, there's no origin, there's no purpose, there's no morality, and there's no destiny outside of God. We looked at that last week as we studied who is God. This week we're going to talk about who wrote the Bible. Who wrote the Bible. So I want us to look at a couple of verses this morning. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. We're answering the question today, who wrote the Bible? 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. The Bible was Dr. Billy Graham's text for over 80 years as he preached the gospel around the world in an unprecedented manner, manner witnessing and sharing the gospel with literally millions of people by broadcast and in person all around the world. His message was from the same message that we proclaim here. And that is proclaimed all around the world on every continent. The message of Jesus Christ as we find in the Bible. And 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 and verse 17 says this. All scripture is breathed out by God. Just, just let that sink in for a minute. All scripture. Scripture means sacred writings. All this in the Bible. All scripture is breathed out by God. Remember in Genesis when God created uh, the, the Garden of Eden and then God created Adam and he formed him from the dust of the ground? And then at the end, how did he enliven him? How did he bring him to life? The Bible says God breathed into Adam his breath and man became a living soul. That's the origin of man. That's how man began. God breathed into him. And the Bible says about itself, God says, I breathed out the Bible to bring life to the nations. All scriptures breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, that's showing where we're wrong, for correction, that is showing us how to fix it, and for training in righteousness. We said this year is a year of equipping. This year is a year of development. This year is a year of growing in Christ, okay? 
The Bible is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And here's the end result. That the man of God or the woman of God, the person of God, the person who's trusted Christ and believes the scriptures and follows the scriptures, obeys and believes what God has said, that he may be complete, equipped for every good work. We want you to be equipped. We want you to be strong so that when somebody attacks your faith, you're not threatened. I remember when some of the Dan Brown books came out, Da Vinci Code and things like that. And they were challenging the authenticity and the veracity and the truthfulness of the scripture. And uh, people who were shaky in their faith, they thought, oh no, well they find these false books. And these books that the, the Catholics were hiding for years supposedly. And they, they began to challenge. It was, it was a work of fiction, okay? Dan Brown said it wasn't meant to be a historical work. But it, definitely there were allusions to the scriptures and discrediting the scriptures. And people who weren't solidly prepared to defend their faith began to be shaky. Began to question the authenticity of the Bible and the veracity, its truthfulness of the Word of God. The Bible says that it is breathed out by God. Theo Nupstenos in Greek. Well, that doesn't mean anything to you. Here's what it literally means it means God whew, breathed out. This is a special book. There's nothing like it. And today we're going to be talking about what makes this book so special. Who is the author of this book? Let's look at one more verse, and then we're going to look at four things this morning about the Bible. Another verse is 2 Peter 1.21. You were in 2 Timothy, going down near the end of the New Testament, is the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21 gives us a process whereby the Word of God came to us. All right? It tells us about the author of the Bible. 2 Peter 1.21 says this, for no prophecy that is speaking forth of the word of God, pro famy means to speak forth. No word of God that came forth, no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. The Bible didn't initiate with man. It was initiated by God. It came forth from God. It was breathed out by God. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God. God spoke to their minds, he spoke to their hearts, he directed their hands as they wrote what he said to them. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Most of you have been to a stream at some point in your life. If you go out to uh, the Blue Ridge Parkway, I love where we live, man. I love that we have celebration in our name, and we can celebrate all that God's given us in nature around here. And, you know, I, I just love getting out into nature. I don't do it enough. But, you know, you can go down by a stream, and in the spring you get some twigs and some foliage beginning to come out, and you can find a little twig on the ground, and you can throw it into the stream, and you can see the stream just carries this twig along down the river, down the stream. That's exactly the picture that we have of how the Word of God came about. God spoke to men's minds. He spoke through their personalities. There were, therefore, we have different types of writing in the Bible. We have different styles of writing in the Bible. God used men. He used their personalities. But he guided them like that twig going down the stream. God guided its very destination and the very words and the very thoughts that man had. God superintended the writing of the scriptures. Holy men of God spake as they were carried along by the Spirit of God. Now, I don't know about you. Maybe you're not at that place yet where you think you can really trust God and you can really trust His Word. That's what this series is all about. I hope if you're not there, that at least you're moving along in that direction. Because here's what we believe here. We believe that we can trust God. We believe that he, we can trust His Word. We believe that if God says it in His Word, that it's true and that we can trust it. Amen? We believe it. Now, some of you may not be there yet, and that's okay. We're glad you're here, and you, we want you to come. And at the end of the service today, we're going to do something really cool. I'm not even going to tell you what it is yet, okay? But you can come as you are, but God will send you away changed if you'll respond in faith to him. Now, so the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 that God breathed out the scriptures, 
that God says in 2 Peter 1.21 that man did not originate the Bible. He did not come up with the ideas, but that God superintended, superimposed upon man, and he communicated his thoughts to men who then communicated in writing what God wanted to say. And that the Spirit of God superintended that work. So this morning, I'm going to give you four reasons. Last week, we gave you four reasons to believe in God. If you didn't get it, go online and get it. This morning, four reasons that we can trust the Scripture. Who wrote the Bible? Number one, I can trust the Bible. And you can write this down. I'm going to give you four things to remember this morning. I can trust the Bible because of who wrote the Bible. Now, what we've just learned is that God superintended it, but it was a partnership. Now, I'm going to give you a few uh, beginnings to partnerships and see if you can complete them. Sonny and peanut butter and Adam and, now this is for some of you that are not millennials, Simon and, there you go. I love you people. That's okay. You're my peeps. Okay. You're my people. Simon and Garfunkel. All right. So we, we got these partnerships that we remember through time. The partnership, what you need to remember about the Bible, I can trust the Bible because of its author. I can trust the Bible because of its author. God was the author. He used men as writers. You could say amanuensis, you know, a person who writes for another. But God used, God spoke to men. He used their personalities. He used their writing styles. He even used their hands to write it. But God was superintending the work. It was a partnership. It was superintended by God. It was what theologians call a dual authorship. Dual means two, like a dually. Some of you have dually trucks. A dually has two sets of wheels on the back, okay? A dual authorship means that God and man wrote it, but God was superintending it. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to think about it for a minute, and then we're going to have a vote, okay? And however you vote depends on whether or not you're going to heaven. No, I'm just kidding, just kidding. Do we have the Bible because of Christianity, or do we have Christianity because of the Bible? Now, think about that. It's kind of confusing. Do we have the Bible because of Christianity, or do we have Christianity because of the Bible? How many opt for the first one? How many think we have the Bible because of Christianity? Raise your hand. All right. How many of you think we have Christianity because we have the Bible? Raise your hand. Okay, now I'm going to lead you to the place of realizing where you were wrong. <laughs> I want to talk this through for a minute. Okay, how did it come about, particularly the New Testament? We're going to talk about uh, authorship and, and, and uh, writings and preservation in just a few minutes, but how did this book come along? Now, think about it. Some of you have seen some of the Bible series that have been produced on t- television, and some of them have been really great. But you got these guys who'd followed Jesus Christ for three and a half years of his public ministry. They followed him. Cindy's explaining the question to Ben. Ben, okay, we're, <laughs> Cindy, did, did he get it yet? Okay, Ben, we're going to get to you in just a minute, okay? Thank you. I, I see Cindy's going. <laughs> That's really cool when people are engaging. Will you guys please come back next week? Yeah. Uh, don't, don't get mad at me. Oh, getting preset twice. All of you who are married understand what he just said, right? Okay. (laughs) All right. So, now think about it. These men had sacrificed their life. They'd given up fishing. They'd given up everything that they knew, their life, and they followed Jesus for three and a half years. One of them was his half-brother. Can you imagine growing up like that? You know, everybody's, you know, anytime James did something, his mother would say, well, what would Jesus do? <laughs> so James got the idea, I think I'm going to make some bracelets and sell them. But he put on there, what would JD, WWJD? But he didn't mean what would Jesus do. He was like, what would James do? He had an alternative bracelet, you know? So like, you know, when he pulled up to the four-way stop on his camel and he went through without stopping completely and the officer came to arrest him, he says, well, what are you doing? He said, you even got a what would Jesus do bracelet on. He goes, uh-uh, not me. This is a what would James do bracelet. <laughs> you imagine growing up being Jesus' half-brother? What would Jesus do? You know, when they ran out of Diet Coke at the party, they looked at James and said, hey, you remember Jesus a while ago? You remember what he did? And James, uh-uh, not me. I'm James. 
It would have been difficult. But James, a half-brother of Jesus, he hung out with Jesus for three and a half years. He saw the miracles. He knew who his mother was. He knew that he claimed to be the Son of God. And then he saw him do miracles and raise the dead and heal the sick and feed the hungry with just a few pieces of food. He saw these miraculous things. And and all these guys, their lives had been completely dedicated to Jesus Christ for years, for three and a half years. And then he died on a cross. Well, like most of us, they kind of miss the message sometimes. And like they were hiding and they were afraid and they were worried and they were nervous. Like, are we going to face the same fate? By the way, most of them did. They faced martyr's death eventually. So they were hiding and they were afraid. But then Jesus rose from the grave and Jesus appeared to them. He popped into the room. He talked to them. They saw him alive. They knew it was the God they had followed for three and a half years. And some of them were related to. They saw Jesus come alive. And over 500 witnesses saw Jesus. We'll be talking about that one week. And they saw him. And they, they realized that he, in fact, was who he said he was. And that he'd raised from the dead. And from that point forward, they followed him wholeheartedly. Most of them gave their lives as martyrs for Jesus Christ. Even James. Mary at the cross, who knew Jesus was virgin born. She didn't fight what was going to happen on the cross because she knew it. All of these reasons, all these people that followed him, and then they said, God spoke to them. He said, write down what you've seen. You realize the New Testament was not written by people of faith. It was written by people of sight. These people actually saw Jesus. They walked with him. They talked with him. They saw the miracles. They saw everything. They were absolutely fully convinced. And they put their whole life and their whole eternity on the fact that Jesus Christ was God and is God. They didn't write about what they believed. They wrote about what they saw as eyewitnesses. That's how we got the Bible. It was really, you know, the Bible was written over a period from like 90 A.D. to a little bit later in time. And then about 300 years later, they gathered all these documents and they put them together. And what we now have is the total Bible. But Christianity had been existing already for hundreds of years because of what people saw and witnessed. And so then they wrote it down. So we don't have Christianity because of the Bible. We have the Bible because of what people saw and witnessed. About Jesus. Now that's incredible to me. That's incredible. I can trust the Bible because of its author, because of its dual authorship. Eyewitnesses who laid in their lives because of what they saw brought about the scripture. Number two, I can trust the Bible, number one, because of its author. Number two, I can trust the Bible because of its uniqueness. I can trust the Bible because of its new uniqueness. Now, it claims of itself inspiration. We just read it, that God breathed it out. Did you realize no other documents, no other religious writings claim that they're actually the word of God? The Bible claims to be God-breathed. The the Bible claims to be God-preserved, that he directed men to write, and they recorded exactly what he wanted them to write. So it's inspiration, it's preservation, it's dual authorship. Do you realize the Bible is unique in that, unlike the Quran, who, suppose, who was written by Muhammad, and there's people who actually did the writing for him, but he was the author, and he said that the angel Gabriel came to him. This was about 500 years after the first Bible book uh, in the New Testament was written. It was in 600s, and he had this message, he thought, from, from Gabriel, the angel, and he wrote it down. One guy. But the Bible was written, God and men, over a period of 1,500 years. 1,500 years, 40 different writers from different walks of life. There were farmers, there were fishermen, there were politicians, there were kings, there were statesmen, there were were doctors. There were people from all walks of life, from three different continents, over a period of 1,500 years. And they wrote the scriptures in a way that perfectly blends and fits together like the pieces of a puzzle. From generations to revolutions, from Genesis to Revelation, and from the beginning of time into into eternity past, God superintended the writing of the Bible for over 1,500 years. It's a remarkable book. Not one contradiction. 
Now, some people say there are contradictions in the Bible. And once you, at first glance, there might appear to be. But once you study carefully, you find that there's no contradictions in the Scriptures. Next time somebody says there are, just ask them to show you one. And if you can't figure it out, then let's talk about it. Let's look at it. But over 1,500 years of time, 40 writers, three different continents, three different languages, Aramaic, Greek, and Hebrew, one central theme, one central person, fitting together like a puzzle. It sounds to me like it was supernaturally written. Amen? It's very different from any other religious writing or religious book. Fulfilled prophecies. The Bible said this is going to happen, and this happened in great detail. Hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born, it told where he was going to be born, how he was going to be born. He was going to be born of a virgin, what his name was going to be. And he's, in all of these prophecies, 300 specific prophecies about the very first coming of Jesus Christ to the earth in flesh as a man. Some of you heard the illustration that if you took silver dollars and you got in one of Samaritan's purses airplane and Matt flew over Texas and he started dropping out silver dollars all over the state of Texas up to like a foot deep all over the state of Texas. It's a massive state. But you took one of those silver dollars before the exercise began and you marked on it with a red pen. The state of Texas, a foot deep, millions and millions of silver dollars, and you take a blind man, and you drop him in the middle of the state of Texas, and you say, you've got one chance to pick up that silver dollar with the red mark on it. Those are the odds of 300 specific prophecies, hundreds of years before Jesus came, being fulfilled, the same odds as that. It's indeed a supernatural book. It's miraculous. I bet my life on it. I bet my eternity on it. Billy Graham bet his life and his eternity on it. It has an impact. The fulfilled prophecies. And we could go on and on and on about those. It's impact to change lives. You know, we have on our website a place called Your Story. We would love for you to send in to Dustin. Dustin at CelebrationLive.net. Some of your testimonials, some of your stories of how God used the word of God. He brought you out of some kind of life and some kind of background and he brought you to Jesus. We'd love to share your stories online. But the, one of the overwhelming evidences that the Bible is really truly from God is the impact to change lives. It changed Billy Graham's life as a young farmer boy early in his life. And he dedicated the rest of his life to nearly age of 199 and a few months old, he dedicated his life to Jesus Christ, as have millions of people. Lee Strobel, some of you saw the movie, The Case for Christ. Some of us, our life groups, went to see it a couple of years ago when it first came out. He was a, a writer, and he was a, a, an atheist. He didn't believe in Christ. And he set out, like uh, many others have done through time, to try to disprove the Bible and he began to research how the Bible came about and how it was written and how it was preserved and all the manuscript evidences for the Bible. And this man who's highly intellectual and a highly paid writer, he came to the conclusion that because of what the Bible says, he understood that Jesus was who he claimed to be and his life has been changed ever since. If you haven't seen the movie, you can go on YouTube. It's on YouTube now and watch The Case for Christ and it will absolutely challenge you. If you're a skeptic, I encourage you to watch that movie even today. And if you're a believer, watch it, and it will set foundations underneath you. It's impact. It's worldwide popularity. Do you realize the Bible is a best-selling book according to Guinness' Book of World Records? The Bible is a best-selling book of all time. It's estimated that over 5 billion copies of the Bible have been sold. 5 billion copies. Best-selling book of all time. Overwhelming manuscript evidence. Now, what is a manuscript? We don't really use that word very much anymore. Manu is like manual. It means a hand. Script is to write. So a manuscript is handwritten documents because obviously before the invention of the, the printing press, there was no way other than with handwriting to write documents. And back in Jesus' day and in the first couple of centuries when the Bible was being written and compiled, uh, there was no other way but handwritten. Do you realize there's over 6,800, 
That is 6,800 manuscripts, handwritten, preserved documents that all fit together. Now, not all of them are the complete Bible. Some of them just have pieces of the Bible. And some of them have the complete writings of the Bible. And then they, they put all these together. And that's greater than any other work of antiquity. The manuscript evidence and, the, and how close they were related to the time in which the authors wrote. The manuscript evidence is overwhelming. Listen, I'm just teasing you, whetting your appetite in this series, but you can study these things for yourself online. You can go online and research manuscript evidence for the Bible. And many very highly intelligent people have come to know Christ that they've studied the manuscript evidence of the Bible. That's 5,800 Greek manuscripts, 10,000 Latin manuscripts that are extant, that exist today, and 9,300 other language manuscripts just of the scriptures. The Bible claims, the Bible's claims are a reason we can believe it is the scripture. The Bible claims over 3,800 times, thus says the Lord, or God said. The Bible clearly claims to be the inspired word from God. And the unity in the diversity. As we said before, all these authors writing over this long period of time and never a contradiction, the unity of the Bible. So I can trust the Bible because of its author. I can trust the Bible because of its uniqueness. Thirdly, I can trust the Bible because of its revelations. I'm not talking about the book of Revelation, although that is a revelation of Jesus Christ. But the revelations, the thing that the Bible reveals to us that we could not have known on our own. There are many scientists who are atheists, and we talked about that last week. You need to go online to get the message if you haven't seen it. People who do not believe in God, their presupposition is that everything came from nothing and no one and no designer. We believe the opposite. We believe that everything came from someone, and he created something, and he created from that everything. God, we believe that. But we believe that I can trust the Bible because of its revelations. Here's a quote for you. You can write it down. It's not going to be on the screen. But I want you to write it down and I want you to think about it. And you can tell, use this in witnessing to people. The Bible is not a book. I'm going to go slow. The Bible is not a book. And I'll repeat it again at the end. The Bible is not a book that men could have written if they would have. The Bible is not a book that men could have written if they would have, that is, on their own, or that they could have written if they would have. Okay, so the Bible is not a book that men could have written if they would have, or would have written if they could have. So the first part of that statement is this. The Bible is not a book that men could have written if they would have. They couldn't have even if they wanted to. Why? They didn't have the information. Without God divinely inspiring them, they didn't know where the, the earth came from when God created it. Before he put Adam and Eve in the garden on the, on the sixth day, nobody was there to witness it. God told us where we came from. Now, a lot of people deny that, and they push that aside, and they suppress the knowledge of God that is innately built into every human being, and they worship the creation more than the creator. But we could not have known our origin if God hadn't told us. It tells us our destiny. It tells us about God destroying the earth eventually with fire and creating new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. It tells us our origin. It tells us our destiny. We couldn't have known that without him. It tells us our morals. We talked about this last week. How, how, what's our moral base? Where do you get your basis for how you live your life? It comes from the Bible. It tells us our purpose. We couldn't have known our purpose for existence aside from God. God tells us all kinds of things that we couldn't have known unless he told us. The Bible I can trust the Bible because of its revelations. Did you realize this? Back in the 600s B.C., the prophet Isaiah is writing about the world. This is 600 years before Jesus. And the prophet Isaiah is writing about things of God. And he refers to the earth as the circle of the earth. That blows my mind. 600 years before Jesus, God's word told us that the earth was a sphere. The earth was a circle. You realize in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. People thought he was crazy. This was 1,492 years, almost 1,500 years 
after Jesus. This writing from Isaiah was 600 years before Jesus, 2,000 years before people were absolutely convinced that the earth was a sphere. They thought it was flat. They thought when Columbus sailed and he came to the Americas, that he was going to fall off the end of the flat earth. Some of you still believe that, right? They didn't put an astronaut on the moon. Uh, you know, some of you conspiracy theorists, maybe you're still there. Okay, but 2,000 years before mankind discovered that the earth really truly was circular, God had already said it in his word. Man, fascinating. Do you realize that in 1400 B.C., when the book of Leviticus was written by Moses, that he makes this proclamation about the human anatomy. He said... The life of the flesh is in the what? Blood. Some of you have been in church a while. You know that quote. The life of the flesh is in the blood. You realize why George Washington died? George Washington was sick. They didn't understand the value of blood. They put leeches on his body. They put leeches on his body to bleed him because they didn't even understand the value of blood to the human body. Many people died from bloodletting as late as George Washington, because he did not know the value of the blood to the human body. And here, 1,400 years before Jesus Christ, the Bible has told us already, the life of the flesh is in the blood. I believe the Bible is trustworthy because of its revelations. It told us things that we could not have known on our own. Our purpose, our origin, our morals, our destiny. The Bible, man, he couldn't have written it if he would have because he didn't have the information unless God gave it to him. But also, it's a book that he wouldn't have written, he would not have written, even if he could. Why? Because it puts man in a bad light. You know, every other religion in the world, besides Christianity, says there's something that you must do in order to earn your salvation. You've got to be good enough. Your yin and your yang have to balance out. You've got to find a way to do more, and your good outweighs your bad, and hopefully then eventually Allah will let you into heaven, maybe. The Bible is the only book that stresses done, that all that needs to be done has been done by Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Amen? The Bible t- tells us, That everything that needs to be done to purchase your salvation was done on the cross. That's the message that Billy Graham preached for years and years. Jesus is the answer. But man, most, all other works, works of antiquity, old works, or present works, religious works, without Jesus, they stress that man has to somehow orchestrate his own salvation. But the Bible is a case of do versus done. That all that needs to be done has been done by Jesus. The Bible teaches things that man would not have written even if he could have written the Bible on his own because the Bible Bible tells it like it is. There's only one person in this whole book, this whole collection of 66 books that we call the Bible, there's only one person who is flawless in here, and his name is Jesus. Everybody else is flawed. You're flawed. I'm flawed. Everybody's flawed. Every child that has been created by God since Adam and Eve is born with a flaw and a sinful nature. Man couldn't have written it if he would have because he didn't have the information. And he wouldn't have written it as it is if he could have because it puts man in a helpless light. Do you realize you cannot be saved? You cannot receive the gift of eternal life until you realize you are helpless to save yourself. The Bible is a salvation story that only God could have thought of where man is totally helpless to save himself. Fulfilled prophecies, we've talked about that before, and there's thousands of them. The continuity of the scriptures is types and antitypes of pictures in the Old Testament that were fulfilled in the New Testament. The prophecies of nations in Daniel, in the book of Daniel, we we read in very good detail without using the names of uh, uh, the, the empires of the world. The book of Daniel lists out exactly what, what's going to happen with Alexander the Great, what's going to happen with uh, uh, Babylon, 
the Medes and the Persian, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire with uh, Alexander the Great and the Roman Empire. The Bible gives in great pictorial language a prophecy of the world, great world empires that will inhabit the earth. The book of Daniel. I can trust the Bible because of its trans, because of its revelations. And the Bible is a revelation for all people. Every race of people, every tongue, every language, every skin color, every ethnicity is a book. Uh, it, it, the Bible is written for those people. So I can trust the Bible because of its author. I can trust the Bible because of its uniqueness. I can trust the Bible because of its revelation. And lastly, I can trust the Bible because of its transforming power. We talked about the disciples. Cowards. They ran away and forsook Jesus at the cross. But once they saw the resurrected Jesus Christ, they never again doubted. They weren't perfect from that point forward. They were just forgiven. But they were absolutely convinced that Jesus was who he said he was. Their lives were transformed. Even his half-brother James was willing to be a martyr. You think they were willing martyrs for a hoax? I think not. Why would they give up their lives for something they knew was false? Something they knew to be a lie. They, their lives were transformed. But after, after the resurrection, they were bold and unintimidated. They were willing martyrs for Jesus Christ. I believe I can trust the Bible because of its transforming power in my life. When I was a little boy... I heard the gospel preached and I knew in my heart that I was a sinner and that I could not save myself and that I needed to call out to God of the universe who was the only one that could save me because Jesus had died for me. He died on the cross for me. He was buried on the cross for me. He was put in the grave to prove that he was in fact dead. He was pronounced dead by a Roman executioner and then three days later he fulfilled his own prophecy and he came out of the grave. Amen? Amen. I can trust the Bible because of the way it's transformed my life. As a next step today, would you, would you write this down? I will put my confidence in the Bible and its author. We don't just trust the Bible because it's a book. We trust the Bible because of its author. The writer's superintended by the Holy Spirit, guided by the Holy Spirit in every word and every thought. He used their personalities. He used their writing. He used even their handwriting style initially. And he presented to us a work that is unmatchable in any work of literature anywhere in the world. I truly believe this book. I base my life upon it. I trust my eternity to it. Because of the author. Have you ever trusted Christ? Maybe up until this point, maybe you weren't so sure about God. And maybe you heard the message last week. And this week, you weren't so sure about the Bible. How is it different? And we only scratched the surface today of the differences between the Bible and all the other uh, religious writings. But this book... Is trustworthy. Now, if it's trustworthy, and if its author is trustworthy, then I've got to believe and respond to its message. And the message is that I am totally helpless to save myself. God is my only hope. And his son, Jesus Christ, died for my sins. He was buried in the grave and he rose again. And if I will stop trusting my religion, stop trusting my good works, stop trusting my family, Stop trusting my traditions and start trusting Jesus alone. He will come into my life and save me just as I am. Would you pray with me? Would you close your eyes with me? And wherever you are watching this message, you need to know that the message of Billy Graham and the message around the world and the messages of people to this very day are based upon the scriptures, the word of God revealed by the author of all life. Today, today, you can come into relationship with him by faith. Would you say something like this if you want to cry out to him today? Dear God, wherever you are, you're saying this to God. Dear God, I don't ever understand everything about you, but I do believe in you. I believe in your word. I believe Jesus came and died for my sins and was buried and rose again. And I believe that I can't save myself. God, would you save my soul today? 
I cry out to you, Lord, come into my life just as I am and save me, Lord. Make me your child. And then, Lord, I'll live for you every day. And now for Christians. Listen, this is so important. Many people say they know Jesus. They've professed him as their Savior, but they're not living in the book. They're not living according to the book. They're not following in his steps and in his word. Would you make a new commitment to him today? Every Christian hearing this message, in this room, in your car, online, on your phone, in your living room, would you make this commitment to God as a Christian? God, I'll make a new commitment to you, the author of this book, and to listen to, to heed, to learn from, and to follow the instruction in this book Because I'm confident that you are the author. Would you say something like that to God right now? Dear God, I trust your book. I trust you. And now, Lord, I'm going to spend the rest of my days in the power of your Holy Spirit that lives inside of me, listening to, obeying, and trusting your mighty word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us?